you know, I'm, I'm, I, I look after myself. And I can be at the gym and I can push 100 kilograms on my chest and do 10 reps on that and feel, yeah. In a week's time, I might do 110. That's still not gonna be good enough. After that, I'll do 120. That's still not gonna be good enough. And I think it's just the mindset I have now. It's never good enough. It's you, what can you do to get better, to do more, to achieve more? And... Do you ever feel happy and satisfied though? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Happy that I've achieved what I have. Not happy that I haven't achieved more. Tonight we are here, socially distanced of course, to hear from a coveted speaker coach, keynote speaker, MC and facilitator. He works with entrepreneurs, startup ventures, SME and ASX listed companies both in Australia and internationally. A board member for Guerrilla Establishment, an industry expert for WA leaders, a public speaking specialist for modern people, a presentation mentor for Impact 100 WA and a speaker coach for TEDx Perth. I want you to join me in giving a massive welcome to the man of the hour. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Mr. Shil Shangavi. It's a Amazing to think that after all, all this time and all, all that I have experienced, I now get, get the opportunity to help others around the world fulfill their lives and dreams. It's a, a privilege. From the conversations I've, I've had with my parents, I think I was 10. We tried to map it out and see what it was. And look, I, I think it was a combination of the bullying, a lot of the trouble which I used to get into, a lack of confidence in myself and a combination of things. But we, we, we've never been, been able to pinpoint exactly why it was there. Yeah, constantly, constantly. I felt like that for so long. It's just for so long. Ready, steady. Like I was quite a small, skinny guy and the bigger guys would just pick on me. They just pick on me and it beat me up, partly because of my stutter. And so I got to a point where I felt like I needed to protect myself. And whilst I tried to retaliate, these guys were much bigger and stronger. I mean, I remember my mum and dad would dread you know, the stories which, which would come out of school. I think we all knew there was something about me. I was a magnet for trouble. Why was the case? I think we all th thought it's part of being a 10 year old. But it's only until I've really explored why all this was happening, I now start to understand. I think it was just a way for me to tell the world that, hey, I'm here, pay attention to me. Well, whilst I was born in Nairobi, I moved to, to Mombasa at a very, very young age. So I'm, I'm actually from Mombasa. Per se, which is a little, it, it's a little island off the coast of Kenya where you don't get a lot of white skinned people and all of a sudden I've come to a country where 
there are very few dark-skinned people. It was very tough. It's tough to make friends, it's tough to adjust to the culture, and but I tried. And when did you move to Australia? When I was 15. Did you move on your own or with your family? On my own. It's crazy. It's crazy. I, when I think back to it, I realise it's crazy. I realise I was very young. My parents also realised it was very young. A lot of kids from Kenya go to England or America. They all do the same thing. They'll go to the same places. And we've got some family here. My mum's got two sisters here, her brother's here. So we had some connection. And so we thought, why not go to Australia? And they shipped me over when I was 15, 16. <laughs> It was difficult. Uh, the shock of being in a new country with a new culture, struggling to make, make, make friends was very hard. I struggled to communicate. My stutter was quite bad. I thought I'd record this video um, because for the last three weeks, so ever since the Christmas break, my stutter has been uh, really bad. Uh, for some reason, I've been struggling to control it and it's caused a lot of anxiety for me. And unfortunately, because of that, the, the ability to control things starts to fade, even though I practice every day and I keep doing things every single day but because my start is getting worse it's adding to my anxiety levels which in turn is affecting my confidence so it's a question of digging deep and just strengthening the mindset keeping the practice going and ho hopefully getting through this period. I, 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 so if, 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 if I actually don't do or control all this stuff, it's tough for me to actually get my words out. So one of the things I do is I'll tap my fingers and, and I'll, I'll, I'll often speak to the rhythm of my tap. And the reason I do this is because I've, I've, I'm not sure when, but I read a long time ago that when a stutterer sings, they don't stutter. And I thought if I can distract my mind, see what that does. So this, this, is, this for me is a tapping, but it's also a distraction technique. And then I realized I've got the beat in my head, I've got the distraction technique, but if I go back to basics even more and breathe, slow down and put all, if I can find a way to blend all these things in, it'll give me hyper control. Uh, the turning points was when I was asked to deliver this talk. It was worth a lot of money and because of me, we lost it. And that weighed down on me a lot, heavily. And I still, I can still remember the look of the, my clients and everybody else in the boardroom has, has, has though to say, yeah, that, that's your fault. It was my fault, we know it was, but I can still remember that stare, that, that layer of them. And so that's when my mind flipped and I thought, I need to do something about this because if, if, if I don't, I will struggle. I will continue struggling. And then over my corporate career, the more presentations I was asked to deliver, I just the anxiety, the stress, the panic it used to cause me and the number of jobs I lost and the confidence which I've lost because I haven't presented well, it just ate away at me. So I started to practice, I started to just, I went, I, I went along to public speaking clubs and got up on stage and did more talks, built my confidence. And the more I did that, I thought, I love this because I can, I can control this, I have a way to control this and the, the resilience that I built over the years and the, the, 
the pain which I've gone through, I guess, taught me that internally I can control things in a way that a lot of other people perhaps can't. And that was my superpower. And as soon as I felt a sense of calm and control, being on stage and being in front of an audience, I knew that was for me. I don't know what some people do eh, at this time of day when they're by the pool. Do they have a job? I wonder that too, but look at us. <laughs> so I'll just get this done, man. This will take me 14 minutes to cook, okay? I thought it was great. I actually thought it was a great, really good idea. He was hating his job, hating the people he worked for, um, just being in that world. It wasn't him, it didn't suit him, and you could tell he'd had enough. And he'd started this public speaking thing um, sort of on the side, doing little bits and pieces. And then when he said he just wants to do this, and that was it, I was like, yeah, great, just do it, go for it. My first professional gig was, yeah, it was at a conference in the Pan Pacific, uh, probably a year and a half ago now. I was terrified, terrified. Uh, also the fact that at that event, I was speaking after an international speaker. I remember when I got to the Pan Pacific, I stood outside and I just started to hyperventilate because I felt I couldn't do it. But then I just went in. It was in a room with about 30 or 40 people. But from there, it's just gone from strength to strength. And now I'm feeling, because my profile is growing, now when I get booked to speak, there's an expectation that it is going to be brilliant. That's it. People book me and they go, well, it's chill. You know, and and, and it's, 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 it's been very tough to adjust to that because all of a sudden it's gone from an audience of 10 to an audience of 500. And I'm the headline speaker and everyone's paid to come watch me speak and it's just, Where are we headed? Western Power, which is, they're a big ele electricity company. And they booked me to speak. How are you feeling about it? I'm shitting myself. You just don't want to not do a good job for a big brand like this. So there's always this fucking, there's always this little combination where no matter how many times I practice it in, in the car, like I'll stutter, so which means when I'm then in front of the actual audience, you need to think extra carefully so that you don't. I feel like I'm not gonna do a good job. My mind's going crazy, it's going down a rabbit hole. And I'm always afraid that when I do this, I'll stutter. You see, breathing is one of the most important elements to public speaking. For me personally, I breathe in a very systematic way because doing so allows me to control my stutter. Something which has affected me since I was very young. Now to give you all an idea, there's approximately 300,000 people in Australia who stutter. 
And there are several types of stutters. And of all those, I have two kryptonites. A block and a prolonged stutter. And when that happens, I can't get my th the words that th out. And th 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 this is what I s s s sound like. It's frustrating and embarrassing because I know what I want to say. I sometimes just can't say it. Uh, this is just a, 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 a lot going on in my mind. I'm going to go home, sleep, play some music and sleep. Yeah. I need sleep. Coronavirus is spreading rapidly across Australia. WA has seen its biggest jump in coronavirus cases since the outbreak began. The World Health Organization has declared coronavirus a global pandemic. How we'll navigate our way out of the COVID-19 pandemic and return to some form of normality. I, I, I was going through this string of emails which were coming through. And after the last one, well, the last one that I read before I, sh I, I shut my laptop off, I just thought, it's all crumbling. It's all, everything I've done is falling apart. In two days, I lost, either lost, canceled, postponed, 80% of my work. Those two days, my stutter was through the roof. I, the only person I would speak to is my wife. To me, at that point in time, it just really hit. And we were working from home, isolated, and I thought, how long could this possibly go on for? Mm. My, my mind was thinking, even if it doesn't go for long, I've lost 80% of my work here. And it was just time, time. Time to dig in, time to think differently, time to adapt, time to... Yeah, and it took him 24 hours to basically <laughs> dig deep and find a solution. So this is where it all happens. <laughs> Why is there a green screen? So this is what I use for my Zoom backgrounds. I do a lot of online presenting. This is my new headset. <laughs> so this is my new Oculus Quest 2, which is for Chatterbox Virtual Reality. I put it out there a couple of days ago on my social platform and it went, I, I can't keep up with it, it went crazy. It's shaping up to be a big event because I've called it a game changer. And so I'm really putting myself, my brand and everything I've worked for on the line by calling it a game changer. So I need to deliver for this. This is, 
the scariest, most nerve-wracking, most nerve-wracking, intense pressure I've felt since I've started. On talk days, you know, I wake up at the same time, I'll have a cold shower. It takes me 22 steps to walk from my bedroom to the kitchen. If I don't do 22, I go back and start again. I meditate. Before a major presentation as well, I'll switch off calls and emails. I, I don't take emails or calls from people on the off chance that it's going to be an uncomfortable chat. I don't want that to throw me off. I normally will call my wife and I just go through with it. But part of that is I just, I'm, I, I want them to reassure me that I can. Do you reckon we'll need to run a test? M&M, once M&M is done, I'll be here. Lights go down. Yep, I start speaking. This goes off then. Whew. Yeah, I'm nervous. I mean, look at this, fuck. It's amazing. I'm fucking nervous. I'm, I'm really nervous. to me how you're feeling right now. I can't. Everything I've worked for comes to this. Biggest worry I have is it failed. I, I, I feel like I'm putting everything on the line for this. Why do you do it? Have you asked yourself that question today? Because for so long, as a kid, in my old industry, my last 10 years of career, it's always been you can't do things. It's always been failure, failure, failure. I guess I just want to prove that I can. We're going to get started in about five minutes. So I would encourage you all, grab another glass, five minutes, and it will be showtime. Everybody feels doubt. We're human. We all have it. Understand what's driving that doubt. Build a plan around what you can do to either control it or fix it or work with it. But there's, there's something there. There's something which drives it. And ultimately, you have to face it. But if you really want to do something, and if you really put your mind to doing something, this is coming from somebody who is doing something which is completely contradictory to what I'm supposed to be doing. If you put your mind to it and accept that you will fail, accept that you will fall, accept all these things, but if you keep going, <laughs> My dad was telling me on the weekend, 
We had a Skype call on the weekend and he said to me, I can't believe you're doing this. He goes, I can't believe. I knew when I started this, when I told my friends and my family, I could see it in their eyes, I could see it in there, I could sense it. There was this, oh, okay. okay. You want to leave your full-time job to do public speaking. But I knew in my mind, this is what I want to do. I had the vision, I knew I was going to fail, but I knew I could repeat, rinse, do it again and again and again, and I'd get better. And so it was quite, quite cool that my dad said, you know, I can't believe you're doing this, and you've actually built a career out of it. For the first time in my life, being able to control this, to I've never been able to control it like this. But the fact that I can actually control it now and do something which terrifies me and I've built something out of it now, say to that 10 year old boy that was having such a tough time, what would you say to him now? It was worth everything you went through. I want you to join me in giving a massive welcome to the man of the hour. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Mr. Shil Shengar.